What up, Quai Nation? I don't know how this is going to go. This is the first of a Quai podcast, perhaps, maybe Quai Talks. But we are just going to sit down with the co-founder, Dr. K of Quai Network, as well as CTO of Donna Strategies, and just learn a little bit about, you know, the origin story of Quai Network. So let's get into it. So like, first question, just introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are. <clears throat> Yeah, um, so I'm Dr. K. Um, been in the crypto space for um, 2012, since as, at least a hobbyist. Um, was doing my graduate degree at the time, and um, kind of thought about doing uh, crypto full time in like 2013, 2014, but there weren't any jobs really you could do. So I finished my doctorate at UT and um, went to work for Consensus uh, when I graduated. And then um, I did a spin out in 2017 from Consensus called Grid Plus. Um, came up with and designed, built, and sold the Lattice One hardware wallet. Uh, sometime in 2018, I came up with this idea of how to scale proof of work blockchains. And um, I brought it to a prophet UT, uh, Shriram Vishwanath. And uh, he thought it was interesting. So he got some students together uh, to work on it. Um, and in 2019, we did an NSF grant and that allowed us to kind of do research on it in, at least for me, part time in, you know, 2020, 2021. And then one of the students, uh, Alan, uh, who CEO of Dominant Strategies led a round with Polychain. Um, so I stepped away from Grid Plus, came to work on this full time. So... Very cool. Just kind of my background. Yeah. What um. What's so like further in your background? Like why? What like what have red pilled you? So they say, into blockchain. Um, so back back at the time, um, the first time I heard about Bitcoin, uh, I heard about it on the Nipper, uh, NPR. NPR for those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the story that I heard about was people in Silicon Valley buying drugs with this digital currency, Bitcoin, and its price had just crashed from $30 uh, back down to three, which was the first time I heard about it. I was like, huh, maybe I should go buy some of this Bitcoin. What for? R right. <laughs> well, that, 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 that's exactly right. So, so when, when I initially looked at it, I was like, huh, this is interesting. Okay, digital money. It's three bucks, like take a flyer, right? Um, so I went, and at that point in time, it was super complicated to buy. It was it was something like you had to go to Walmart and spend cash to get like a phone card that you could somehow convert to like an okay pay card, which you could then get a ticket to like Mount Gox to buy Bitcoin. What's Mount Gox? Uh, Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. It's the original <laughs> exchange that rugged, uh, that allowed some version of fiat to Bitcoin uh, sales. Uh, it was out of Japan. Um, that, you know, that's a whole nother story. That, that kind of was the, I think they crashed at the end of 2013, if I recall correctly. Um, anyway, it was, it was too complicated to buy. So I didn't actually buy it for about another year. Um, <clears throat> and, and the reason I didn't buy it is because once I like saw this process, I'm like, no, it's ever going to use this because you can't actually convert it back to dollars. Like this is ridiculous, but obviously that was a very short sighted, short sighted conclusion. Uh -huh. Right. Um, but in the, in the interim, I like, I started looking into it more and I remember back in the day, you know, you'd go on bitcointalk.org and people would be talking about these libertarian values of money and how, um, you know, Bitcoin was this decentralized sort of currency that was independent of the nation state. And they would talk about the Federal Reserve and how the Federal Reserve isn't part of the federal government mm -hmm. and that it's composed of private banks as the shareholders and all this stuff. And it almost seemed apocryphal. It seemed like an internet conspiracy. And in 2012, it was actually hard to find information that actually said the Fed was not part of the federal government, which, which is interesting, right? Like now, if you go on Wikipedia, it'll, it'll, say it right out there, even, you know, the Fed of St. Louis will say, yeah, hey, it's not, you know, it's not hard to find at all. This is, this is a set of private banks that are shareholders that like vote and they, you know, get dividends mm -hmm. and revenues go back to treasury over like a certain amount, blah, blah, blah. Like you can find it now, but back in the day, you couldn't find anything about it. 
Uh, but I just started looking into it. I just kind of fell, f fell down the rabbit hole of money and sort of the origin of money uh, going all the way back to, you know, shells and then yap stones and gold and, you know, started researching it and just the concept of having money that's sort of independent of the government so it can be used to actually establish free markets is just really, really interesting because um, I guess I, I highly prescribe to um, laissez-faire sort of economic systems, mm -hmm. right? It, and, and that's really, as an engineer, when I look at complex systems, I look at them humbly because I know that it's very hard to describe complex systems accurately. So when you look at something as multivariate as the economy, I know that no individual has a prayer at understanding, measuring, or controlling that in aggregate. So you have to let the independent actors make their decisions to make the thing efficient. And so that's what's like really interesting to me because I think laissez-faire is a great way to do things. Um, but if the money system is controlled by the government, you can't ever really realize any sort of laissez-faire economics. Yeah, why is it a good thing, laissez-faire? Like, why do you think that's a good thing? It's just efficient. So when when we look at uh, complex systems, again, because they're hard to measure, what we've seen time and time again is that if you allow sort of individual agents to optimize for themselves in aggregate, you get an efficient outcome. Um, and that's really what laissez-faire is trying to say is that you let everyone act on their own and you'll, you'll end up with a good result. Now, obvious counter examples of that that you get within, you know, justifications of uh, governments and regulations or, you know, tragedies of the commons, things like pollution. And those can be addressed, but those don't mean that you have to move away fully from a laissez-faire. You really just need a mechanism to price an account and pay for externalities. Um, so, yeah. Cool. Yeah. So fast forward, you bought Bitcoin, red pilled, you're working for consensus at Grid Plus for Mr. Lubin, I take it. And what prompted the idea? Like why, why a, you know, multi-sharded, multi-chain system? Yeah. So at the time uh, at Grid Plus, I was uh, working on the Lattice One hardware wallet. And the concept of the Lattice One is if we sort of believe that these systems can have better outcomes, uh, both from individual standpoints, from societal standpoints, uh, just from economic efficiency standpoints, we have to look at sort of what the bottlenecks are. And at Grid Plus, what I was really focused on was um, the UI problem, right? So specifically, if we are going to have crypto and we are going to have crypto that holds these sort of uh, decentralized, credibly neutral censorship resistance properties of money, you need a mechanism by which people can use it in custodian themselves. Right. So if we just say we're going to have crypto and this would be this, you know, gold like sort of financial settlement system and we're still dependent on all the banks effectively to like give us access to that. We've lost all of those properties. Right. So for crypto to maintain the properties, people actually have to use crypto. They have to actually hold crypto in their own wallets. So one of the big problems is we have these seed phrases. These seed phrases are very cumbersome and they don't provide a good UI UX experience. The interesting thing um, that I realized is that cryptocurrency systems are actually far more similar to uh, credit cards than they are different, right? So if you take like a normal credit card today, it has a little chip in it, right? That chip has a private key. That private key is signing a transaction that says like this account wants to move this much money to that account. And the only difference here now is the, you know, the sort of serialization of that transaction and where it goes, right? With Visa MasterCard, it goes to a database that's held by Visa or MasterCard. But with a blockchain, it just goes to a blockchain. But the 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 UI UX portion of it and the interaction at the the individual point is actually technologically or can technologically be almost identical. Uh, it's just we got to build the tooling for it. Mm. So the idea with Grid Plus is, well, what that means is I can take a seed phrase and abstract it to a credit card, like a chip card. And you have to make a custom terminal because terminals don't currently support, you know, this type of interface, but then you can plug it into an interface and anybody that can use a debit card now can effectively have a seed phrase and use it because like they understand how to have a card, they understand how to have a pin. So even if I have, you know, a 65 year old mother who, you know, 
our mother-in-law from China. Mm -hmm. She knows how to use a debit card, even though she might not get the complexities of Bitcoin. That's great. Because like, if I can get her to that point where she can interact in a, in a similar format, we've removed that barrier to adoption, right? And I can just say that is like a prepaid debit card. That's all you need to know. It's a prepaid debit card with a pin and you can stick it in a terminal, put in your pin and spend. So now it has exactly the UI UX experience that money has. So at Grid Plus, I was building the cards and the device to make a wallet that has a similar experience to uh, the current financial system so that you get more broad adoption. But in doing that, what I realized is the fundamental limitations of these systems still were the blockchains. Mm -hmm. Because the throughput is so limiting that even if you create this like great interface, because no chain can handle real transaction volume, it's like all for naught. Right, so it's it's funny. Um, we were making this great wallet to solve this great problem, but we were solving it for like a million people. Yeah, yeah just an echo chamber of yeah, and, and like talking to crypto. There, there's a bunch of people that own the Lattice One Hardware Wallet, and there's a bunch of people that like it and they use it. But the number of people that need it in our society, given the limitations of the chains and what you can do with those chains, it's it's limited. So that is a problem, obviously, and that's getting better over time. But fundamentally, the, the real problem comes back to scaling the chains. Well, I think it's scaling the chains. Um, I heard, I can't take this quote as my own, but I use it all the time, that exactly, it's like an echo chamber. And it's as if to drive a the crypto space today, as if to drive a car, you have to know how to work on the engine, where 99% of the world just wants to like turn on the ignition and go. Like, does, do the pedals work and the steering will work? So I think we're getting closer to that, but we're not there entirely. But... So like on the credit card example, what happens if your you know, grandmother or stepmother, 65 year old stepmother from China, like has an issue. In-law, in-law. In-law, yeah. pardon, um, has an issue with that credit card. Like I can go talk to a bank. Yeah, I mean but that's- But if I'm in crypto, like how, how, like, I feel like that's still a friction point. Well, well, so in the example of Grid Plus, the issue of the card was making money. Um, selling the cards and you could come and ask your plus about it. Now, mm -hmm. if you forgot your pin, there's not much we could do for you, mm -hmm. right? So th there still are some some deltas in, um, you know, user experience. But like I said, having a prepaid debit card with a pin was an exact facsimile of having a wallet on a chip card. Mm -hmm. So that is accessible by a lot of people in a lot of places and they can manage and understand that. Um, now, one one uh, additional abstraction from that, I guess one of the lessons I learned from Good Plus, though, is not only are the chains limiting factor, um, but there's also sort of trade-offs in when, when you're thinking about security, right? So the lattice one was like designed for the penultimate like crypto heavyweight. You know, how do I have a lot of money that I interact with relatively frequently? potentially doing complex things like DeFi in a safe way. So the 1% of the 1% of crypto. It's, it's, it's a small segment, but for that segment, you need like a very, very powerful tool, right? So there was a lot of thought that went into designing, um, you know, the architecture of the system. So you had sort of uh, a general compute environment and a secure compute environment and it's a secure screen and a secure enclave with like a security mesh and like all these features. Um, but one of the things that I realized is you don't need that for everybody and mm -hmm. making that like a $350 device um, doesn't get it to everybody, right? So when when we think about, but, but it also taught me a lot about like the infrastructure systems, mm -hmm. which made me realize how similar the infrastructure systems are than they are different, right? When I talk about like the physical Visa MasterCard networks and the payment terminals and the payment cards and the chips, including NFC, Right, NFC being the sort of tap to pay item on your phone. So what you can do is you can actually use that tap to pay feature and load a similar applet that we were loading on those cards and you could use a, the terminal. Now that uh, requires two things. One, it requires the terminal to let you do it. The interesting thing is they don't actually have to change any of their firmware on the terminals to do it. They just have to allow sort of the issuer to run a backend that interfaces with the blockchain. So that, that's how similar the technology is, is you could literally load an applet onto a thing and all the um, 
The only thing you have to do is get one of the card processors to agree to let you run an issuer backend that interfaces to a blockchain. That's it. Mm. That's like how similar these things are, which is like crazy. But in the example of the phone, the cool part is that's like an over the air app, right? So like what's my cost of getting someone into crypto where they can have a tap to pay experience? It's, it's, it's effectively zero. Right now, the problem with that is they only get the security, so to speak, of their phone. But if they're only like having a few hundred dollars, that's probably fine. Yeah, I mean, the average transaction is what sixty dollars on Venmo. So yeah, well, and the average phone is like a thousand dollars. Exactly. So like, if I have a few hundred bucks in my wallet or like a thousand dollar phone, having a couple hundred dollars that may potentially be at risk if my phone gets hacked, like, is a tolerable thing because people lose their phone and they lose their wallets, and you know this happens. So your security threshold that you provide should reflect the amount of money that you're transacting with. And it should effectively be as low as it needs to be so that it can access the most number of people over the gradient of values. It's kind of a conclusion. Yeah. But the, the other conclusion though, is seeing sort of the lattice one and the size of that market, it was just speaking to like how technologically deficient these blockchains were mm. because like they couldn't actually be used for anything outside of these very niche applications. And once they started to grow or find product market fit, they kill themselves because the fees go up. Yeah. Right. So yeah. like that, that was like the conclusion of grid plus, I guess. So then going back to it, it says, well, well then what's the fundamental problem here? If we want this stuff to work, we've, we got to scale it first. Yeah, fix the base layer. Yeah. So it brings us back. You've told me in the past, um, when you were th coming up with this idea, the key unlock for you involved a mushroom of the magic variety. Not an endorsement, but I'm a fan. Not for everyone, but it's great. <laughs> so in true tech founder fashion, uh, tell us about that story. Yeah, I mean, I've been thinking about like this problem um, for a while. Um, and, um, you know, one, one of, uh, the other people at grid plus was like, Hey, you want to try this? I was like, Hey, sure. Why not? Um, first time doing mushrooms. Uh, <laughs> um, but it was interesting within like a month, I kind of sort of realized the problem and sort of how to solve it. Um, and the, the interesting th within a month. So like it wasn't during your. Well, Trip? yeah, so, so like, like there were conversations, right? And like there were ideas, mm -hmm. um, but like it didn't solidify right there. Like mm -hmm. it solidified over time. Got it. But that was the key unlock. To yeah. To like get you to think about things in a different way. That's right. As they do. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so, so the initial thing that I was thinking about, because I was thinking about this problem for, as an engineering problem, which it is. Um, I was thinking about it from like a resource constraints problem. And so if you look at Bitcoin and people are doing analysis on like why Bitcoin can or can't scale, sort of re what are the resource usages and sort of what is the main bottleneck? And you could break it down by, you know, processing, RAM, hard disk, bandwidth. Bandwidth was like the killer. Uh, it's more specifically propagation time in the network. Mm. So like propagation time in the network was the biggest problem. Why? Like, so explain propagation time for us layman's and why that was the biggest problem. Um, so when we think about blockchains, what we're trying to do is trying to reach consensus. So that's just agreement. But to reach agreement, we have to talk one or more times so that we can be like, yeah, we're all on the same page because what we're trying to do is update a database. We all sort of have to update this in sequence. Um, and the limitation to being able to come into agreement is how many times do we have to talk and how long it takes for us to talk? So in this room with two people, it's very simple. Speed of sound is, you know, uh, 300 meters per second in air. So you're a meter apart. So uh, three microseconds or whatever it is later, mm -hmm. like you hear me and we can go back and forth. So say six microseconds plus your response time, maybe it's a second. So one second and six microseconds later, we can agree on something, Yeah. right? Uh, if we extend that to a global network, what ends up happening when we have many nodes is we have the time between the nodes, which is the ping. Um, so how long it takes the information to go from one point to another, just like because of physics of the wires. And then we have the number of those hops. So in something like Bitcoin, if you have 10,000 nodes, um, 
you might need to do seven hops to get around the network. And the average ping time might be 100, 150 milliseconds. So it's going to take you one or more seconds for a message to sort of traverse through the nodes on average. Um, and that's just like one way. Then mm -hmm. if I like want to come back with another message, it's going to be another second to second and a half. And so this limitation in propagation is like what creates the boundary of how quickly we can agree on something. And the shorter you make block times and the bigger you make blocks, the more important that gets. So if we look at a global network and we say we, we're not looking at Bitcoin anymore, say we take it down to Ethereum and we do 10 second blocks instead of 10 minute blocks. If it takes me a second and a half just to propagate a block in the network, that means during that time, other people in the network are still mining. So they're going to produce a block that competes with my block. So it creates contention. So we're no longer in agreement just by the nature of the mining process in that one and a half seconds. And the likelihood of that happening is the one and a half seconds relative to the block time, 10 seconds. So 15% of the time, there will be an uncle block or like an orphan block that's mm. made that then has to get resolved after the fact. Right, And the bigger those blocks are and the shorter the block times are and the longer it takes to process, the worse that parameter gets. And that's sort of the limitation to scale and throughput is, is sort of the, the first one, mm -hmm. which is how long does it take us to talk? How many rounds of conversations do we have to agree? Mm -hmm. Or reach consensus. Or reach consensus. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question is, how do you improve that bandwidth? Right, And the way that you do that, this isn't like a that magical of a problem independently, it's just a subnet. So if I shrink the number of nodes and I shrink the distance between nodes, I can shrink the number of hops and I can shrink the ping time so that I can talk faster. If I can talk faster, we can agree faster. If I can agree faster, I can push more blocks through the blockchain, more transactions through the blocks. Very, very straightforward. Now the problem that we have with that is I've just created like a subnet, but if I'm like creating a subnet, how do I make it so this is a global system? So we come into a partitioning problem, which is if I have many subnets, these subnets still have to eventually agree with each other. Mm. And then the other problem is, ideally this is only helpful if the subnets are agreeing on state independently of the other subnets. So once you introduce subnets, you have to introduce shards, right? And a shard means we're, we're going to make an agreement on what state we process. So this is also like a well-known engineering mechanism, mm -hmm. right? If I want to scale a database, I shard it. So an uh, example would be in Facebook, right? Um, you know, A through M will go in this shard and uh, N through Z will go in that shard, right? So you have sort of two replications. And then when you get a query, like by last name, like you'll either go here or you'll go there. But then what can happen is each one of these can operate sort of independently of each other just by sort of how you route. So like sharding is a known mechanism to scale. Now, the third thing that makes this hard though is you have the consensus mechanism, which in this case was proof of work. Mm -hmm. So the sort of key concept of the unlock was that you could do merge mining in a hierarchy of chains, which would allow you to both create subnets and create shards while not sharding the work, meaning everybody is still eventually making the same work commitments to the same set of transactions, but eventually. So it basically lets us uh, stretch our consensus in time so it percolates up in the shards and the subnets until there's sort of a global consensus. Um, and that was like the, the first sort of key realization that I came up with in um, like 2018. Hmm. So any, anyway, so a uh, hierarchy of sort of merge mine blockchains was the key unlock, mm. um, at least the first of many. Uh, there's probably at least another four or five uh, since then. So, But mushrooms was the, the one thing that led you think about it from a different standpoint. Yeah, yeah. Um, They're great for that. Yeah, definitely. So the, the other interesting thing is about a year after I came up with it, um, I actually stumbled across um, something that Peter Todd had proposed, which is tree chains. Who's Peter Todd? Uh, so Peter Todd is or was a Bitcoin developer. I don't know if he still contributes. Um, I think he works for um, Block uh, Stream now. They're doing drive chains, uh, but he came up with this idea of tree chains, which is very similar in many ways to. 
um, what I called block reduce. Mm -hmm. um, so, so similar idea. So I, I can't say I'm the first to come up with it, um, but no one's ever implemented it. <laughs> Uh, and there's been a lot of secondary challenges and understandings that have been needed to sort of figure it out. Who are those? Um, so what, one of them was this concept of sort of how you maintain atomicity across uh, inter-shard transactions. So if I sort of send a transaction from this shard to that shard, how do I guarantee that if it leaves this one, it completes in that one? And if it gets rolled back in that one, it kind of either will eventually complete in that one or sort of reverse in the other one. So sort of when I execute something that influences two of the shards, that I sort of guarantee that it executes. Um, and the concept of uh, coincident blocks and reciprocal validation um, is something we kind of had to figure out over time. We did that sort of during that uh, NSF grant period. Um, that was one of them. Another one was Poem. That was a more recent one uh, within the last year. So originally when we thought about this, um, you see you have this hierarchy of chains. That means you have sort of different block types, right? You have zone, region, prime blocks. Um, and our original concept of consensus was you would just sort of pick the, you know, uh, heaviest chain in sort of prime, the heaviest chain in region, and the heaviest chain in zone. And that would create sort of a pick for what your tip should be in any given zone block. Mm -hmm. The problem with doing that is it creates sort of this indeterminism between two of the zone tips. So if like these two zones sort of have a competing region block, then like how do I weigh that region block differently uh, from like this th zone to that zone? And what can end up happening is somebody can withhold that region block. So with like a traditional weighting mechanism of Bitcoin, not only could they withhold that region block, they could withhold it for the average region block time. Mm -hmm. um, which basically would eliminate sort of all guarantees of liveliness and security in the system, which doesn't work. Um, so this was like actually a big point of contention because what was happening is we were uh, just like trying to get the system to work, right? So we had sort of built the infrastructure to make a hierarchy of merchant change, which was not uh, trivial by any means. Uh, but as that was like developing more and more, we kind of got ourselves into this sort of uh, tautology and like we figured out there's sort of this recursion that's unsolvable here and we were like stuck. And so we were thinking about it in like different ways and like trying to make different decision trees. But however we sliced it, there was always like an edge case where we couldn't make a choice. We couldn't make the right choice or we couldn't make the same choice in all contexts. It's so, like you just couldn't get determinism, right, based off sort of order of arrival of mm -hmm. blocks in context. Um, and I actually remember <clears throat> Yanni, uh, one of the uh, grad students, um, he... Uh, grad students at UT, right? Yeah, he, he's still a grad student at UT, man. Was that PhD is tough. Eight, year, year eight for him. It's uh, tough. <laughs> he's, he's just got to do it, man. Um, Anyway, so so we were like coming up with different sort of concepts of uh, the hierarchical longest chain rule. Um, and we, we were like trying to make like alternate proposals mm -hmm. to try to like fix these recursive tautologies. And we were talking about like, you know, going from the bottom up versus like top down and just like slight variations. Mm -hmm. And then Yanni came in one day and we were like arguing about two of the variations. He's like, you can't do that because if this miner gets lucky and he has that block, like he can do this, that, or the other. And he just kept using this argument of luck, like in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And it just like pissed me off because <laughs> like if, if you're talking about a random process, there isn't sort of luck in a random process. There's a distribution of outcomes mm -hmm. that has an expectation on a distribution. Like what the fuck is luck? Yeah, it's an auction. Well, it's, it's not even that it's an auction. It's that like... Luck isn't luck. It's it's a, it, it's a sample in an expected outcome. So like this will happen necessarily based off the fact that you're doing proof of work. Like you will, you know, if you have proof of work and it's evenly distributed across the field in terms of hash, right? Your distribution of share is going to have a, a, a Poisson distribution, like clearly, right? But you, you have to talk in distributions and expectations. You can't talk in luck. 
So we were like having these conversations and sort of debating like up, down, down, up. And it just like got me super riled up. And um, um, then like I went home, went to bed. And then Saturday morning, I was just kind of getting like a lazy Saturday morning. Um, like I woke up like with an answer in my head, which was Satoshi like also made the same mistake that Yanni was making. Um, and so specifically what that was is that it isn't luck, right? And throwing away sort of information in the system is reducing your sample of the distribution um, is, is like what the initial sort of realization was. But what that turned into was the weighting of the blocks was incorrect. So basically in Bitcoin's treatment of consensus, when they're talking about the sort of heaviest chain rule, mm -hmm. they're just adding the likelihood of each block up to the likelihood of the next block up. So it's an independent set of events. So they're saying, if I have a difficulty, it takes me sort of a thousand tries to get it. So this block's worth a thousand. And then they go to the next block and they say, okay, well, this block also took me a thousand tries to get it. Right? And then they say, okay, well, what is the total weight of this chain? It's 2,000. That's what he did. But the failure there is that when the second block references the first, that's no longer an independent set of events. So I shouldn't be adding them. I should be multiplying them. This is like combinatoric. So like if I have a coin, just think about a coin. If I flip it once and I get a heads, that's like a 50-50, mm -hmm. right? So that's like, that's like uh, one of two, let's call it. And then, you know, if I flip it again and I get another heads, you wouldn't say that the likelihood of getting a sequence of two heads in the row, if this sort of second head was deterministically pointing back to this event as a predicate before you did this, that it's also a 50-50 shot. It's one in four to get two in a row, mm. right? And then it's just exponentially one increases. in eight. It just yeah. exponentially increases, which is multiplication. It's not addition. Mm. So the problem was what was happening and why you can withhold blocks is because the statistics weren't being done right. We, we were we were adding things that were dependent events. You can add things that are independent events, but you can't add things that are dependent events. You have to multiply them. So understanding sort of, okay, or, or, or sorry, getting like irked about luck made me really consider like what we were doing in the distribution, which mm -hmm. made me realize that we weren't even measuring any of this process correctly. And so we came up with an alternate proposal, which is just like use math to like do the problem, Yeah. right? Uh, which is, okay, if you ask me how likely is it to get 10 heads in a row, it's two to the 10th. It's not, uh, it's, it's not uh, you know, adding, whatever that is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that was basically the origin of poem or proof of entropy minima. Um, but that was like absolutely key to this whole idea. Uh, without that, there's like no way to get determinism. Um, and so what and what POEM is actually measuring in the system is super interesting. It's measuring the uh, number of hashes you need in expectation to generate a chain of equal or longer weight. What does weight measure? Absolutely fucking nothing in Bitcoin's context. Mm. But in POEM's context, it's telling you the statistically interesting property of the chain which is how many hashes have gone into this chain. That's like what it's telling you. Mm. And if I'm comparing two tips in a chain that's meant to be a work-based chain, what property do I want to know about? How many hashes went into it, mm. right? And I want to pick the one that has as many hashes as possible. So there's a couple properties that came from this idea. One of the properties is I can now compare different types of blocks. So. I now have a mechanism for sort of comparing a zone block to a region block or like three zone blocks to a region block or a prime block or like a prime block and a region block to seven zone blocks. Everything is like equally comparable here because everything can be fairly measured in like expected number of hashes. Mm. And then the other thing that happens from this is because we're using the sort of achieved work or the intrinsic work of the system, every the sort of uh, weight of every block is as unique as its hash, okay? Like its hash. So mm -hmm. a hash is two to the 256 is the field size. So the likelihood of getting a collision in hash is zero. I mean, it's it's one in two to the 256. Mm -hmm. It'll happen like once in the heat death of the universe. It doesn't happen, right? 
It just doesn't happen. Yeah. So what that means though, is that we have a guaranteed unique weighting of every block. So now if I have a block and I show it to you, you will weight that block and preference that block exactly the same way as I preference that block, regardless of when you received it. So if you receive it now, you receive it 10 years from now, it will have the exact same number associated with it. And because of that property, it doesn't matter how long it takes you to get it, we will always make the same choice. We will always give it the same exact weight. And like, that's how the whole system works. Mm. And if you don't have that property, like you can't do this. So in, in some ways we got kind of lucky because we were pretty far down this road. <laughs> Like after to be all fair, that, after all that, it was luck. <laughs> well, well. So, so, so to be fair, right? We had like built this system, um, and so you know we came up with poem like a year ago, like almost exactly a year ago. Maybe it was like a year and a month, a year and two months, something like that. Something. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was like early, early spring last year. Um, so that would have been twenty three. Hmm? So I was like five years into this journey <laughs> and I was just, I was just like following the thread, right? I'm like, what is the physics? Like make a hypothesis, do an experiment, move on to the next step, make a hypothesis, do an experiment, like learn something, move on to the next step, right? I was doing that for like five years in some part or full-time capacity. Uh -huh. And we almost like found ourselves in a corner that we couldn't get out of. Hmm. And then we found like this exact little point in space where we're like, oh, we can sit exactly right here and this will work. Very cool. <laughs> no, that's great. I mean, what what did that unlock? Like Poe, I know, I know, you know, we weren't thinking of a lot of, you know, features on Quai before that. So that I know Poem allowed us to unlock a lot of things that are unique to us. So what yeah. did what did Poem unlock? Yeah, so so the, the, the interesting thing about Poem is it, it's like the key piece to do the hierarchy of merge mind chains. So effectively what's happening now is in Quai, um, there's no leader. All the zones are technically leaders, right? But since every zone, the bottom chain, so to speak, they're progressing asynchronously, but every weight that they're producing is unique. So if there's ever a conflict, everyone in the system can always decide instantaneously like who is the winner of the conflict, right? And because everybody can decide without having to talk, we can get determinism. If we had to go back and forth even once to say like, oh, we should pick like the A block instead of B block, mm -hmm. like none of this works. So it's only the fact that we like found this like magic little point in space that we could get this hierarchy of blockchains. So what it's achieved is it achieved uh, scale on a proof of work chain. And the uh, the scale is really only limited by the sort of cross shard transfer time. So you can keep on adding shards uh, and the only compromise you're making is that to do cross shard transfers as the number of shards goes up, the time logarithmically increases with the number of shards. That's like the only compromise. But what that basically means is, what, what we've really sort of achieved is, is how can you scale a proof of work system to sort of the physical limits of the system. And the system being the internet, the wires, mm -hmm. the hard drives, the RAM that is running on these computers, like that is the physical limit. So, so this system at least heuristically approaches what is physically possible within the system constraint, uh, which, which is like what it achieved. Now, as we understood that, we started to understand other, th other things. <laughs> um, and one of the things that we understood is uh, mine transactions. So there's sort of like three levels that are going on initially, right? You have prime region zone. And what we came up with was this idea to sort of like make a fourth level, which is a transaction. Okay. And the reason that that's interesting is twofold. One is if I can mine a transaction, so I basically put work on a transaction, I can use that share of work to objectively and deterministically order the transactions in the block, right? And that's interesting from a MEV perspective or minor extracted value, because with minor extractable value, <clears throat> um, basically what ends up happening is transactors have to bribe miners to get ordering in the block. But if you say, hey, miner, your ability to produce a block 
and when a block is related to your ability to include transactions in this block, and all those transactions have to be ordered in the order of their share, else this is an invalid block, we've sort of realigned the incentives between a block proposer and a miner, which didn't exist. Uh, and what that eventually does is that actually makes it so that you don't have MEV. <clears throat> and what that means for a practical user is if you're doing a swap and you're doing slip, instead of getting exploited by a MEV bot for the full value of your, your slippage, you can put, say, some percentage of that slip into mining your transaction, say 5%. And when you do that, you're making it statistically unlikely for somebody to beat you because you've been able to mine it before they knew what you were transacting. So you've sort of made this like pre-commitment a priori, which makes it much more expensive and much more unlikely for a MEV bot to come in, sort of be able to mine a greater share and get inclusion prior to your block getting included. So um, you can effectively eliminate DeFi-based MEV in these systems now because of that like next sort of step uh, from Poem. Uh, and then the other thing that that does, which is really, really cool, is it actually makes Poem way better. <laughs> well, before we get into that, let's like walk through the like MEV situation and like an Alice and Bob, I don't know, you don't like those names, but like an Alice and Bob scenario, like really break it down. So like you're using percentage wise on the mind transaction and for DeFi users, but what about like cost example? Um, okay, so, so, so let's like sort of uh, talk about different users in the system. If there's a user in the system and all they care about is like buying a spin drift, mm -hmm. um, they don't care about this at all, right? because there's there's no minor extractable value in buying a spin drift. So they just make a transaction, put in their base fee and they send it. It's gonna get included in a block. You don't really care what order it gets included in the block because there's no MEV here. Uh, so for transactional use cases, you don't care about MEV. For the use cases where you have sort of Alice and Bob, okay, and say Alice is trying to do a swap on Uniswap. Um, there's these attacks that exist where once Alice broadcasts her transaction, say she's trying to convert ETH to, uh, USDC. And maybe that's not a great example because there's probably not a lot of slip in the market, but yeah. let's imagine there is slip in the market. Some sort of meme coin. Yeah, it's it's a meme coin. Um, <laughs> uh, Pepe or something, um, I don't know. Uh, Black so, cock, you know. Uh, <laughs> I think that's a big one right now. That's, that's a Solana, big one these days. Yeah. Dog uh, with hat, there you go. Do dog, that's Solana, dog but... with hat, there you go. Um, so she's trying to <laughs> trade like ETH for dog with hat. I mean, that's a $5 billion token. That yeah. probably has good liquidity uh, now yeah, too, it man. it does. But, um, it's about to be on the sphere. Anyway, so so maybe she should trade dog with hat when it's only a million dollar market cap, right? Uh, so there's a lot of slip in this transaction. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is she says, okay, I'm going to go to this AMM and I'm going to submit my transaction uh, to buy um, $10,000 of WIF, right? Bob now sees this and Bob knows that this is going to move the market. So Bob can make a transaction before her transaction that effectively makes Bob money because she's about to slip the market. Right, so he can sort of slip it first and then she ends up paying more and then he can sort of sell it back because there's two market makers on this side. There's there's many different types of this, but basically the, the upshot of MEV is that if you commit to a transaction before it executes and then I can make my transaction execute faster than yours, knowing what you're about to do, I can make money. Right, this is sort of the whole basis of like dark pools and high frequency trading that mm -hmm. exists in normal assets, but it gets worse on a blockchain because you don't have you know microsecond or millisecond execution. You have these like ten second blocks, so it gets really really bad. So anybody that's trading in these pairs is just continually paying oh, yeah. money. It happens all the time in like huge amounts uh, to these what we call MEV bots. But the reason that this works is because the MEV bot, for effectively no cost, can just make a competing transaction by and then and then try to get it uh, uh, executed before Alice just by adding a greater fee, right? So he, they can see it and then like immediately create a better transaction yeah. that should get ordered first. And like, that's why they can do it. So the whole concept of the mine transaction is <clears throat> if Alice mined that transaction first, when she exposes it, Bob is gonna look at that and be like, oh man, she just put enough work on that that whatever like sort of GPUs I have in my back room, it's gonna take me at least 10 seconds 
to like make a better transaction than hers. But that transaction just went in the network and all the miners are incentivized now to include Alice's transaction because it adds to the block weight. If it adds to the block weight, it means that the miner is more likely to win the block and that block become canonical. So miners are all incentivized now to like add as many of these weighty transactions as possible. And so if I'm Bob and I'm saying, okay, it's gonna take me 10 seconds to replicate this. I'm prob I'm gonna have, I don't know, like a 10% chance of being able to find this and then get inclusion in the next block, right? So then when I say, should I MEV Alice, I have to multiply that potential revenue sort of by my cost, but also by my likelihood, right? So that's why Mev, that's why Alice only has to pay a fraction of the mining or the slip cost to mine relative to Bob because Bob's at sort of this temporal disadvantage. Right, because like once an Alice is announced, Alice could be sitting here with like one GPU and she could have been like, last 10 blocks, she could have been mining the share and she finally like finds the share she wants and she could broadcast it. So like with a lot less hardware necessarily than Bob, she could mine this transaction over some period of time and then there's like a commitment to it. Now, Bob then in that compressed time frame, which is between when he sees it and when it gets included, he now has to mine a greater share. Mm -hmm. So he has to come in with more hash rate than Alice, and he has to get it done in a more compressed time frame and still hope that it propagates in the network and gets included, else he isn't gonna win. So his sort of likelihood of that outcome now has to play into his math, right? So if it's only a 5% chance of him winning, right? That means that Alice only had to put 6% of her slip in. And then Bob is gonna rationally say, well, I'm not gonna try to MEV Alice because in net expectation, that type of MEV transaction won't make me any money. Yeah. Like that's so how it works. Effectively, you put, what is it, Jared from fucking Subway? Is that his name? The ETH bot? Yeah. yeah. Jared from Subway. That fucking son of a bitch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> puts him out of business. That's great. Yeah. That's great. And like and in that situation, you mentioned GPU, Alice could use hash power, but like for the general user, like, you could theoretically build a hash market where like you don't even need a GPU to transact this way <clears throat> yeah, or so, to participate. Yeah, absolutely. So like what it would potentially look like for Alice in sort of long-term equilibrium mm -hmm. is Alice would still be paying a tip to a miner, but if there's um, sort of a liquid market for providing hash for these transactions, that tip would go to buy hash to put on her transaction rather than just giving money to a miner to order in a block. So from her perspective, it would look identical in the wallet and then the back end, it would get routed to someone to do the work and then it would get broadcast or chain. And you can even put sort of the payment in the protocol so that um, the miner only gets paid if they only do work and she can sort of you know, decide what price she wants to pay per hash, like when she's putting up the transaction. You can even have the wa wallets do like an analysis and say, um, how much MEV is on this transaction? How much work should you include to sort of have a certainty of not getting MEV? Mm -hmm. And then how much is that gonna cost based off like current market conditions? And all of this can happen. And it actually looks exactly the same to the user, which is when you do a transaction, if it is MEVable, it'll basically have a suggested minor tip and you just hit send and that minor tip goes off somewhere and like gets mined and then gets broadcast and you don't get MEV. Wonderful. And you mentioned GPU. So walk, I know we were, you know, ASICs are the popular choice on any work-based or like larger work-based chain. Like, why do we make the choice or why did you or Kwai make the choice for GPUs? We went back and forth between um, GPUs um, and ASICs and even CPUs at one point. Um, there, there were sort of a couple of requirements, um, you know, in terms of, because we're a sort of a high throughput chain, one of the requirements was that whatever validation you're doing on a transaction, um, that hashing needs to be tight enough that you can do it on many, many transactions. Um, and that kind of eliminated things like RandomX. Because um, RandomX on a CPU, if I was to say, okay, I'm gonna use that hash algorithm to also hash transactions, um, which you potentially want to do for various reasons, you're not going to be able to do 2,000 transactions fast enough because mm. uh, maybe it's a millisecond or two milliseconds a hash, 2,000 transactions is suddenly two to four seconds. You're trying to hit 10 second blocks. You can't take two to four seconds to hash all your transactions, like not possible. Um, so that so immediately we were kind of like in the buckets of uh, GPU and ASIC. Um, and we were actually leaning towards sort of the ASIC side of this coin um, for a bit. 
uh, you know, it's simpler. Um, it's technically more efficient from a finalization standpoint, at least statistically. Uh, but we talked to a bunch of people in the market and recently launched sort of proof of work coins with their sort of experience in the marketplace. And what we heard is um, basically anything that's asicable will be instantaneously FPGA able. Um, What's FPGA able? So FPGA is kind of like the middle ground between a GPU and an ASIC. It stands for fully programmable gate array. Um, but effectively, before you have time to sort of spin silicon to make an application specific integrated circuit, you can program into these FPGAs and make things that are potentially 10 or 100 times more efficient than a GPU. Um, and what that does is that means that if you were to sort of launch with an asic bowl algorithm, uh, you, and you sort of develop this GPU miner community, the second that like there's actually real money under that, someone's gonna create what they call a bitstream to an FPGA, which is gonna let all the FPGAs mine this. And there's just gonna be a handful of like six or seven miners that have these and they're gonna soak up the entirety of your supply. So you're gonna kill sort of your organic mining community and you're gonna centralize a lot of your supply and sort of the network into these half a dozen people's hands. Um, and that's feedback we got from coins and miners. Like miners were like, if you do this, we're just gonna like- Fuck you. Yeah, we're basically. Like take over your network. Yeah, so so then we're like, okay, well maybe we shouldn't do ASICs. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and so then we started considering GPUs. And one of the things that made GPUs more interesting to us is just the sort of geostrategic uh, differentiation between the two. Uh, specifically, if we are successful creating a scalable proof of work chain, our expectation is at some point we'll be able to compete uh, with global currencies. At which point there'll be high incentive uh, for various governments and nation states to control uh, its distribution. And so the um, thought process was that if you had a general purpose uh, piece of hardware that's needed to get into the system, that would be much harder to control than an application specific piece of hardware. And if there's one thing that you can still well control, it's uh, import and export at ports. So if you were an ASIC dependent network and a certain country wanted to ban those ASICs, it would be trivial for them to do it. Um, so from the geostrategic perspective, but also from the perspective of sort of early centralization, as well as um, dependency on ASIC producers and, and what that looks like, we thought it was a better idea to go with uh, general purpose hardware, yeah. GPUs. I mean, it makes it more democratic too, which is like what this is all about. It's not technically democratic. Well, not in the traditional sense, but like a uh, lower barrier to entry. It's a lower barrier to entry, yeah. right? The more whole, distribution. The whole system of proof of work, right? It's, um, it's economic voting, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which is a little bit different than person-based voting. Uh, but it's really the only good Sybil mechanism that exists that's decentralized, um, right? Because it doesn't require identity. Um, it creates this great property of immutability. Um, and that's really the power of proof of work and like why it can be used to come to consensus uh, and create immutable ledgers. So, yeah. Yeah, and we kind of... I don't want to say backed into, but like with the rise of ChatGPT AI, NVIDIA stocks going crazy, like the GPU narrative is everywhere, which has allowed us to kind of, along with Poem, get into this hash cash idea or energy money idea. So like expand on that a little bit. Um, yeah, so I've been thinking about blockchains. I've been thinking about how to kind of realized the vision of Bitcoin. And the vision of Bitcoin that was originally laid out was, you know, a credibly neutral, decentralized, uncontrolled, open access form of money for everybody. Like that was the vision that was originally laid out. They said digital cash. And there's a technical component of that. And we've been talking about the technical component of that, which is like, how do you scale? Because mm -hmm. if I can't scale, uh, that lack of scale leads to recentralization. Um, through custodians, through needing intermediaries because people can't get access to the base chain. So they, they're dependent on secondary systems if that's you know a custodian or if that's an L2, this happens, right? 
So, so the, the other thing that I've always been thinking about though is just the system holistically. So you have like the technical aspect, but you also have sort of the incentive design and economic aspects. And, and one of the things that's interesting to witness with, with Bitcoin is that uh, everyone says that it's sound money, it's digital gold, right? They, they moved from the sort of story that it's digital cash. Okay, now we can't scale. So then what is this good for? It's good for a store of value. It's good for digital gold, right? Um, which, which I find funny because every time somebody sort of changes like that narrative responsibly like that to a technical deficiency, it's really just admitting they have a technical deficiency that they can't solve, which is fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but but it, it provides an interesting case study in that if you have Bitcoin and if you have dollars, what do you spend first? Dollars. Absolutely, right? Because your expectation of the future expected value of Bitcoin is always going to be higher than your expectation of the future value, expected value of dollars. Um, so the problem that Bitcoin suffers from, even if we could scale Bitcoin, let's say Bitcoin could do 50,000 TBS, like tomorrow. If the dollar exists in some capacity, I'm still always going to spend my dollars first. Mm-hmm. So even if we can scale it, because it has this like sounder form of money, it's still going to be hoarded no matter what, right? Uh, because as long as there is a bat, like a inferior form of money as it's called, you will always spend that first. And as we've seen in time, there's always enterprising individuals or governments that are very keen on inventing inferior forms of money. So the problem is for Bitcoin is how does it maintain its economic sustainability over time, right? So the security of Bitcoin right now is basically paid for by the block subsidy. So it's inflation, but its inflation curve goes to zero over time. And as that inflation like subsidy keeps going down, sort of the amount of money going towards security is also going down, right? And so the problem is if I'm not having enough money generated in transactions to offset the block subsidies or the inflation subsidy, like where what's the incentive for my miners over time? And what's my, the incentive for my miners to do it at a high enough level that it guarantees security for high values of money? It basically goes away. And people have actually talked about this in the Bitcoin community, right? They'll, they'll talk about like very, very, uh, you know, ardent, like old school Bitcoiners are talking about the fact that they don't know if 21 million is an actual cap because they don't know how far past this happening, there's a sustainable security margin on Bitcoin. Um, and in the long term, effectively, the security margin is only what you can generate in fees, right? So if you're stuck at five TPS, then suddenly, like, what do you have to charge per transaction to like maintain security? You have to offset the entire inflation subsidy. So suddenly transactions are minimum $1,000 in transaction. And then the question is, are you even gonna find five TPS at $1,000 a hit to like keep that system going? I don't think it's sustainable. Um, and so the question then becomes, the way to have a proof of work chain become sustainable is you need transaction throughput. I need fees. I need fees that keep growing as the subsidies go down so that the fees are sufficient to displace the subsidies. So you need scale. But you also need the economic incentive for velocity because even if I could scale Bitcoin again, no one's going to spend it and no one's going to spend it at like $1,000 a clip because there's dollars mm-hmm. or there'll be like the thing that comes after dollars. So so the idea was, okay, well, how do we create a sustainable monetary system if you, we have like this hoarded asset? Like, I don't think you can do it, certainly not in a proof of work context. So I did a lot of reading in history and economics, and I was trying to like understand what economists thought about this idea and sort of what ha- has happened in the past. Um, and the the one the one that sort of rang most true with me was uh, uh, Gresham. Gresham like postulated this thing called Gresham's paradox, which kind of explains this phenomena in in a more concise way. Which basically says if there's an inferior form of money and an inferior form of money. Um, the inferior form of money will always circulate and the superior form of money will always be hoarded, AKA, you know, Bitcoin and dollars. Okay, so what he's basically saying to you is if you want to have a monetary system that has velocity, you have to have an inferior monetary component, something that has a, a worse uh, average future expected value than the store value, uh, which you would say is the unit of count or the medium of exchange. 
Uh, and I kind of refer to this as Gresham paradox in our current system, sort of analyzing it more, what I see as how the fiat system has actually been working is these two things exist. The shares in the central bank, the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. are the inferior or the superior form of money. It's just only 6,000 banks with bank charters have access to that form of money. And the inferior form of money is the dollar. So we don't have access to the superior form of money. Only the banks do. And the we only get access to the, the inferior forms. And it circulates. It has velocity because we use it every day. We price goods in it and it sort of loses 5 to 10% of its value every year. And, but it works as like the monetary asset that circulates. So the idea here is if we're going to create a store of value, we also need to create something that's kind of akin to the dollar that has these properties of velocity and is inferior to the store of value. And that's where the idea of chi came up. So um, basically what Qi is, is a token which is issued relative to the hash rate of the network. And what we've done is we've created sort of this mechanical link such that miners will want to mine Qi if their price of production is less than the market rate. And their price of production is electricity costs in aggregate. So basically what ends up happening is we've created the system where we've created the shelling point where if everybody in the system plays the game correctly, the value of chi should always tend to the cost of production, i.e. the price of electricity. So what that's done for us is it's created this asset that has relatively stable purchasing power parity globally over time, but also can be slightly inflationary. So we have something that can act as a store or a, a unit of account. It can act as a medium of exchange, uh, and it also sort of acts as the inferior form of money here, which will guarantee that if you can scale and if people adopt the system, people will transact in this format, which will generate revenue, which will allow you to sustain your mining, and like that's the concept of chi. Energy based money, yeah. And it let us go into that. Oh, thanks for the snaps, Cloggy. Yeah. <laughs> and it, like what I was getting at before is the, the GPU angles. We have a longer term thesis at Quai that just as personal computers started as a hobby and like went into, you know, ubiquity, everyone carries around a computer in their pocket. We think with the rise of AI, gaming, just like a NVIDIA stock, like writings on the wall, we think we'll see that same GPU ubiquity in the future. And with the rise of AI, you'll see these autonomous agents sort of trading and transacting. And like they will want a form of money that directly cor correlates to their input costs. So we think yeah. like we think that they can't go to an AI can't go to a bank. They can't open a bank account. There's no physical property. So Yeah. There's there's the digital aspect of it, but there's also just the um the physical aspect to it. And and I know I know you and uh, David like the Love it. The the AI one a little bit better, but I love it. But, it's a long term like vision, but like I think yeah, yeah, like, they're, they're going to trade. They're going to like be a part of. It's like humans and machines are going to be a part of our economy in the future, and like they will prefer a input cost or a money associated with their input costs, which yeah. like an energy based money like well, suits but, them but, entirely. But in, in in the in the physical setting, it's not much different, right? Um, if we think about goods and services in the economy, if it's a competitive good, the sort of upcharge of that good by every you know retailer in the economy is effectively reflective of their energy input that's directly in terms of you know gas or electricity or like paying a salary to you know an employee who then goes home and like keeps their house and buys food which was farmed with a tractor using mm -hmm. diesel it's it's all energy at the end of the day so like the deltas in every markup in a competitive good is energy um and so energy like is sort of the most ubiquitous and natural pricing input for all goods and services in the economy. And because it's it exists in sort of every good, it also makes a very, very good um, unit of pricing. Uh, so much so that you could argue that it's better than any other unit of pricing uh, because if there's effectively a shock in energy inputs, um, if your, your pricing mechanism is in energy, then everything technically got instantaneously repriced. So you don't even have like a bullwhip effect of like pricing having to roll up and down the supply chain. It just instantaneously changes, right? So if like energy costs go up 10%, right? 
this would still be one chi, let's say. Uh, it's just one chi would represent 10% more, more value, so to speak, because the energy cost went up 10%. Um, so, it, so it almost like makes a more efficient economy just in that regard because it, it's just a better unit of account. Yeah, for the global physical economy and the digital compute economy. Well, it's but, but, man but, and machine, but, but money see, for both. You, you see how it's the same thing though. Yeah. Right, it's the input cost to do compute, but it's also the input cost to make this table. It's just like your input cost is largely dictated by energy in both cases. Always. I and mean, yeah. it's like the base unit of the universe, the money yeah. of the universe. Effect effectively. Right? right? At the foundational level. <laughs> well, cool. What's next? What's next for Kwai? What's the future roadmap? Looking ahead? Like what's left? What are the hurdles that are left to get this thing out? Well, what, one thing I do want to mention before we, we run away from um, Chi is we should also mention Kwai exists in the system as well. Um, so, so really sort of circling back on the economic design, um, we think it's valuable if you're trying to create a monetary system to create the entirety of the monetary system. Yeah, so, independent of any external forces. Yes, an independent monetary system. So that means independent of uh, the current financial system, you're trying to create a store value, a medium of exchange, and a unit of account. So Qi sort of meets the requirements of a medium of exchange and unit of account. The store of value is the Kwai token. Uh, and Kwai is, uh, for all intents and purposes, very similar to an Ethereum-like token um, with like a Bitcoin-like issuance. So less is issued over time, uh, but it's Ethereum-like and that it's you know account-based, EVM-compatible. Um, system. So it's it's a two token model uh, and you actually need both tokens so that you have the superior form of money to sort of get adoption and you have the inferior form of money to guarantee use and circulation. Um, and there's a couple different properties too, right? Uh, Qi is much more cash-like. It's a UTXO thing. It has sort of fixed denominations, uh, whereas Kwai is, uh, for all intents and purposes, looks a lot like an Ether-like token, but it's all within the same system and it's all sort of interdependent. So like you can't have Qi without Kwai, you can't have Kwai without Qi. Uh, you you really need them both. Yeah, independent from anything external. Yeah, which is diff different than something like USDC, right? Which is hilarious to me in some ways, right? You have uh, these decentralized <laughs> systems and, and like uh, the SVB thing was just amazing. Uh, you have these decentralized systems where we want a stable unit of account so we end up uh, sort of hypothecating tokens on chain that are representative to deposits in the current financial system. And then we build this sort of DeFi ladder on top of it, um, you know, that's dependent on the pricing and the redemption of that hypothecation, mm -hmm. which means it's just dependent on the banks. Crazy. It's yeah. madness. You're just like moving in parallel. But it's not even in parallel. You're moving on top of. You've yeah, just like sure. you've just like fully integrated into the the dependency rail. It's uh, it's it's cr it's you straight call madness. It decentralized. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's what's next for Kwai then? Um, so we're working hard to get to mainnet. Um, our last test net was very successful. Uh, we proved out consensus in a very uh, long-term and sort of robust test where we did nine shards uh, with a globally distributed set of over 2,000 nodes. We had peak hash rates over 120 giga hash. That was more than say $5,000 a day, I think in uh, electricity input. Um, and that's just a test net. Uh, we did 2,000 TPS uh, for perspective the Visa network does an average of 1700 TPS. So we were doing more TPS than the Visa network. And this isn't, you know, Solana TPS. This is real TPS. Um, it's a whole nother discussion, but so yeah. We'll do another episode. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, but yeah, we, we did real TPS uh, with a bunch of nodes distributed around the globe to show that the system works. Uh, the system, you know, is resilient, attacker tolerant, scalable, proof of work. Um, so that's what we've shown. Um, the next step is we're working hard to get Golden Age out, which hopefully is close to our feature complete test net. Uh, we're introducing a bunch of improvements. Uh, we have libp2p in the system. Uh, we're introducing interlinks, which allow us to do um, snap syncing. and also allows us to do sort of 
concise proving, uh, which we can use to create sort of a decentralized Infura natively within the nodes. Um, we're introducing uh, mine transactions, merge mine transactions. Um, so a lot of new features coming out uh, that should start very shortly. And uh, our goal is then to basically on this code base, get an audit done and then move into mainnet uh, by the end of summer. Summer of Kauai, baby. <laughs> summer of Kauai. Uh, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, mechanic Kel, K, K-A-L-K at the end there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You can follow us at Kauai Network on Twitter. Um, this will be on YouTube. Probably going to start a Spotify podcast list. So download there. Um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. It was a pleasure. Yeah, I appreciate it.